Hey everyone, if you're ready to learn gouache painting or want to improve your gouache skills, Justin Donaldson will be starting his gouache course this Sunday, January 14th. Earlier this week, Justin was happy to share some of his expertise and approaches to gouache, as well as answering some questions members of the Huckleberry art community have about gouache painting. We hope you enjoy it, and if you're interested in signing up for Justin's course, you can use our affiliate link below in the pinned comment or sign up through our website at huckleberry.art. I love it. So uh, why, why are you choosing to, to start painting with gouache? I love traditional painting. I love the feeling of it. I've always had fun with it. Um, and I, I just figured, like, you know, I should be sticking myself in situations where I am exploring things that are different from what I normally do day to day. Instead of just studying character design and Photoshop and, like, all of the very specific niches that I'm known for, just expanding my horizons can expand, you know, the edges of this little context that I've built for myself. And, um, and I'm probably going to have a lot of fun doing it. Like the studies oh, wow. that I did last year were a joy because I was like, instead of having to worry about the big, difficult problems that like my mainline work imposed, I was able to take this like hour, two hours during the day and have a lot of fun making art because I, I really like making art, but it's like, it's way easier when it's, um, it's not something that people have as much expectation on. That is so, true. I've always found Yeah, that. I'm going to take a bunch of classes. And so when I was thinking about taking more classes, you were the first person I thought of to be like, I should take Justin's course. It seems great. It's got a ton of rave reviews. I feel left out by not being able to do stuff like this. I'm just going to get in there and I'm going to have fun with it. It's bearing down on us really fast. It's going to be like a week, right? It like is. It's the 14th. It's, uh, 14th. Yeah. So six days away. Yeah. All right. I, I don't I, feel prepared. I, oh, it's okay. It's okay. We come in. I, I, I'll take care of it. I'll take care. <laughs> okay. You'll be good. What, what experience level does somebody need to be in order to like take advantage of the course that you're doing? Ooh, take advantage is a, is a different, is, is something different from just like doing it. So, um, I, I, we try to have it so that it's basically like you can have not touched gouache before. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to find all of the, the key points that will stop you from improving, the things that you mm -hmm. need to, to learn to know about. So like we were talking about before, you were talking about coming in transparently and using a lot of water. For a lot of people, they don't know where that line of like I'm painting and, and it's not coming out the way that I wanted to. And it's like... Some of it's coming out transparent, some of it's coming out opaque. It's like really finding where that line is so that you can know mm. what to expect when you pick up your paint and put it down again. Yeah, we're just trying to find all of those little, little spots that people don't know about that just get in the way and, and, and stop things from actually working and functioning well. These are things that you can become more and more and more intimate and, and understand. And so you can be at the... You can never have touched it before, and this is going to be like really helpful. Or you could be pretty experienced and just diving uh, deeper into it. So the idea is generally that like we even for for people who are really beginning, like we provide some line work if you know you're following along with what we're doing and you don't really have that confidence in drawing. We will also have people, and actually, I probably would suggest this for you with what little I, with what I know about you. You know, you can do the course and then not follow along what I'm painting, but just use those ideas and take them to something that you're like genuinely interested in. Um, when it yeah. comes to doing... I, I don't know if I'm going to be doing any angel paintings in gouache. Um, no, yeah, it's yeah. An interesting idea to try to do some. I definitely am probably going to play around with some imaginative ideas. Yeah. But I, I don't know. I was imagining myself primarily doing studies with the gouache just because, I mean, I got a lot out of the, the digital studies. But I have, I don't know, I've always admired traditional painting. People confuse my digital painting for traditional painting all the time, or they ask questions about, you know, what side of the line I'm on. I have always looked to traditional media as like a way of, like, a way of working, a philosophy about color and value. When I actually venture into it, I find that I'm, I am lacking a little bit in that knowledge. And so any amount of experience in there feels like it's going to boost my ability to make choices as a digital painter as well. Also, I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to having a medium that is like easy to set up, largely non-toxic, very portable, that like if I want to go and I, I live in Florida, 
being able to go and do plein air painting is very easy. There's a yeah. bunch of beautiful spots that I have very easy access to. I would love one more thing that I can do on a, you know, while the kids are out at school, the wife and I, both painters, to be able to like, how just say like, no, 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 we're just going to grab our kits and we're going to go and head outside and have a day of painting instead of feeling like, you know, we need to be doing painting with purpose. We need to be creating a product for sale or um, making something that is going to grow our portfolio, but to make art for art's sake, having some amount of room for that is a gift for me. And so getting more experience than a medium that can do that more easily than oils, it sounds awesome. <laughs> so so when, I, when I first began, I began in oils. And then I had kids and a very small house and cat. Mm -hmm. and, and I just remember this one time, our, my cat got onto my palette and there was just cobalt blue all over the house. <laughs> nice. and, and we had a kid coming and I was like, I, we can't do this. We can't do this. And so I need to no. find something that I can go out and paint. And like this, this is literally it. This is what I use. Like you go out and use the tray for use the tray as a, your palette. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it all folds up, right? Mm -hmm. So I just got that. And that goes in my bag, open it up. And then you have like these individual wells that you can mix things into. This is all you need. L literally all you need. Got this, which is like flat, so it fits in my bag. Mm -hmm. And there's now a water cup and a roll of roll of brushes. And that's that's literally it. All just fits in my bag, just lives in my bag permanently. Uh, my first thought is what is going on with the style of paint? Because I've got I've got a gouache in a tube and I'm worried that as soon as it sits out for ten minutes, it's gonna turn into a crusty pile of useless oh like so, pigment. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you don't have to worry about that. Um what so what I do is about ten minutes ago this was a crusty pile of paint. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh but but I put water on it. So what I do is I'm gonna try and find one that's um that's all nice and dry. This is this is different. This is actual gouache. This is post mm -hmm. color. There is really no difference. Uh, uh, post color pigments are slightly bigger, but in practice, in what we're doing, it's all the same. Anyway, so so it'll come out like this, right? Super dry, and all be lying in here. Especially if you haven't if you haven't painted in a couple of days. But you come in, put water on it, and then I'll just fold it up and then go out and paint. By the time that I'm out there. It'll have settled and be really nice. Probably if you're just beginning, bringing it out of a tube is a bit easier because I think it's going to be easier to find the consistency that you're after mm. rather than having to, to, to dig for it. But by the time you're done with the course, you're going to be familiar enough that pulling in that water and, and going from dry to wet is going to be you know, pretty second nature for you. So like for the most part, you can see that this is there's some water in there. Um, by the time you're done, it's not really going to be running quite as much, even as it is right now. You'll be out, like, especially if we're talking about plein air painting, you'll be outside. Um, you can see even like I have some, some old orange there. I've got some white here. And so these clumps aren't going anywhere. And there's going to be like little bits where I've used more water. You just grab a towel and like get rid of it. For me, when I first started, I actually really enjoyed using the poster colors because they come in a tub. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's less convenient for going out and painting. But if I'm in the studio, I don't have to worry about like, okay, I'm going to put the paint down here, but like, am I going to like lose paint? Is it going to, you know, I, I just pull it out of there. And uh, you can see like there's little bits of color in there, but. Is that like, I, I'm not familiar with this stuff. Is it like Play-Doh texture? No, no, no. So it's like, what? it is literally. Uh, the poster the color texture. thing is so weird looking to me. It's, it's, I don't know. I guess I'm, I'm going to get some uh, experience with it. We, we've got a couple of, we've got some older supplies that Anya's got. And then, you know, I just bought these, these uh, gouache out of the tube. What did, what did you get? What, what brand did you get? Uh, I got Windsor Newton because yeah, yeah, that's, my, that's... Experience, uh, the, my experience through Anya is that um, there's a lot of mediums that are really uh, brand dependent. And like with watercolor and colored pencil, the most common materials that we give to kids for art are some of the most fussy materials as far as like quality is concerned. Yeah. And, and so a lot of people think that art is hard in part because they've been buying useless materials that are nearly impossible to make any amount of, get any amount of value out of like cheap colored pencils and cheap watercolors are, are dirt. And, you know um, 
You know what I compare this like, to? I compare as this opposed to, to like acrylic, where you can buy cheap acrylics, and cheap acrylics are fine; they're great. Um, <laughs> so what? How about how about gouache? Like I went for I, I sprung for three times the price Windsor Newton because I suspected there was probably there were there were possibly cheaper brands that were not going to give me the best effect. Like, I will not touch gouache. That is an that is like a like a store name brand. Mm -hmm. Like if you if you get a Hobby Lobby, I think it's Moss's Touch. Yeah, none of that. I I, I don't touch that because it's. So we talk about the finding the point where we're going from transparent to opaque. And so if you guys don't know what I'm talking about, I'm just going to, here we go. When, when you're painting and paint transparently, that means you can see through the paint. Mm -hmm. um, but it, and, and so we get thicker and thicker, but it also means that if you're in these like weird in between stages, you can do it. You can do it well and you, you can do it well, but if you don't know what you're doing, you can go from a really dark value to a really light value back to a really dark value, back to a really light value. And so if you know anything about art, that means that your, your brain starts to see the form like shifting and moving all over the place and you don't know what's going on uh, all the way to like opaque. And so it's just really big, nice flat piece of color. And mm -hmm. it's important to know where that point is when you're going transparent or opaque. There's no morality to it. It doesn't matter which one, but you kind of need to know what you're going for. When you start to use those, those uh, terrible brands, from Hobby Lobby and Michaels and stuff. It's just a wild west. You don't know what's going to happen. And and then they also come with, it kind of feels like a bit more like a gel. And so it'll yeah. all just like coagulate or, or sort of chunk up in one area and then be like really loose in another. And so it's just not, you, you're not going to give that to, well, you are unfortunately going to give that to a kid who's going to yeah. have no This success. is going to be most people's experience with traditional art is nearly useless supplies. Uh, somebody in the chat was saying they were just gifted Hobby Lobby paints. And yeah, for certain types, for certain mediums, it's actually not bad. I know some acrylic artists that use cheap hobby paint because it comes in big tubs and it's all just plastic. So who cares? For gouache, you know, because of the sort of transparency and solubility of it, like having it act in a predictable way, like these big art brands, they're not just names on the packaging like they they really affect the way that the the medium behaves you when you're showing the transparency i had a big thing come to mind which is that one of the things that's exciting to me about working in traditional medium and one of the things i think is really cool about gouache is when you work with it transparently in photoshop when you lay transparent colors over each other they like they instantly kind of mix and neutralize right. and like they tend to mix oh, towards yeah, like yeah. a gray or a black working the, one of the things that's instantly appealing to me as soon as I pick up something like this, and I, as soon as I touched the gouache a couple days ago, I, I could see it. You lay down a, a color and then you do a thin glaze over the edge of it. It it behaves like it's got like a blending mode on it, like a digital blending yeah. mode where they 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 like multiply together and they start. You start getting this like translucency that's only possible. I think there's some digital programs that simulate it, but like there is a kind of colorful translucency that happens with traditional media. Very cool to see. And it, it it's not at all like digital painting. And it's, it, it's I think, one of the keys to unlocking some of the really appealing looks that you can get out of something like wash. It's kind of like uh, impressionism. You know, the, one of the key mm -hmm. ideas of impressionism is, is they go, okay, okay, if I put this color beside this color and, and like alternate like this, I'm gonna get this like feeling in my eyes. I'm gonna get this like effect of light rather than mm -hmm. just putting those two colors together and putting it down. And so working digitally, you get those two colors together and you put them down and working transparently, especially, or in that medium stage, just like you're saying, you get these two colors right beside each other and like the pigments are beside each other. And so it, there's a, there's a, there's a feeling and an effect that you just don't get when you're either really mix them all together and put them down yeah. working digitally. It's, it's really cool. Yeah. It's like, as I was painting like a, uh little leaves and then i put some sunlight near it it's like the yellow and orange starts to go actually create a little bit of a glow effect where the two meet i'm like oh this is nice it feels like it's working <laughs> for me it feels it, it feels really good jonas calhoun is, is saying uh i've been thinking about uh taking a set of watertight pill cases and putting a limited palette in each case is it okay to squeeze out good quality tube gouache i have holbein and have it dry out Okay. Can you so, re-wet uh, like uh, some of these uh, paints after you like stick them in a tube? Yeah, you can. Um, so a lot of people complain about reactivating gouache and it coming out chalky. But the, the real reason is that they're putting water on it immediately 
and then expecting it to behave like it's like fully saturated and soaked. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. there, there is a limit in any reasonable amount. You can, you can have it dry and bring it back to life and have it dry and bring it back to life. And so as you give it enough time to really soak in that water, it's going to be really good. I have gotten to a point with a set of paints that I have. I think about three or four years ago, I, I did this work for a game company and they wanted all hand painted backgrounds. And so then they gifted me over a hundred of these, uh, these paints, really beautiful. But I've used them so much that I've taken, essentially the binder has to grade it. And so now that they're, they're a little bit useless to me in any reasonable amount, like if you're going to, if you're going to wet and reactivate, yeah. So long as you're not using it every day for years and still not getting through it, you're going to be fine. You're going to be good. That is what I do for the most part. That's really interesting. This whole thing, they've got this whole setup with these interlocking sealed pill containers. It seems a little elaborate. Seems like there's probably simpler ways of getting this done. It's, so what is, what's your experience with different kinds of travel setups for gouache? Yeah, I, actually, I think it is diff. I, I think the perfect solution hasn't really been found yet. So I do, I do use this mm -hmm. most of the time. I also have just a small version sit fit in your pocket. I have spent some time carrying these around. It's like you're kind of just trying to manage tension. Because if I go out and then I have to sort of unscrew each one of these and put them down and be careful about where they go because they have paint on them, uh, there's a bit of tension. And, and, and that tension can build up and stop you from going out and painting, at least me. <laughs> me very much so. I'm like the princess in the pea. As soon as I get any amount of yeah. discomfort, it keeps me away from doing any kind of thing. Like I, for, for my digital work setup, even, I have to have everything in a perfect place to feel comfortable and get in the zone. Yeah, so my entire setup is based on minimizing absolutely everything that I have to do and every piece, every little piece of tension to just get no friction between the desire to paint and the action of painting. I, I, I would love to hear how that pillbox solution goes because I think that that's, um, I think that's probably a pretty decent solution. One of the hard parts might be, can you unscrew it, put it down and not have it leave paint on the bottom underneath somewhere? Because then you have to stop being careful about, you know, where you're going to place it. I, I like, I really like the trays that you've got. I ended up doing it because of my experience with acrylic. I tried to use a stay wet palette because yeah, what I was I worried that. about that I was going to squirt out a bunch of little drops of paint and then they were going to crust up after 30 minutes. And that was going to be the end of the session. My wife was like, oh, no, you just missed them. I'm like, I'm going to be trying to get in the zone. I'm not going to be running a counter in the back of my head trying to remember when to remist <laughs> paint. I'm going to I'm going to that up. So I was like, I I've got the solution, but then that meant I need to bring this stay wet palette, I need to bring tubes of paints, I need to bring or all the paint brushes. I was bringing paper towels, water cup, um <laughs> my pads. I was I ended up with a French easel because I I didn't have a a lightweight solution for just like putting the the panel up. I was carrying, you know, 30 pounds of stuff with me yeah. trekking out to the spot to go paint and my friend was making fun of me because he's like oh my god you don't have anything better than a french easel those things are such a pain in the ass they so i'm out there like screwing in all the legs apart and trying to assemble oh, no. it in the dirt just because of this this idea of uh, getting rid of tension most of the time i sit on the ground i don't even bring something to put it on but just mm. find somewhere to sit on the ground i i do have i don't have it with me right now but it's essentially a, a tripod just a small little tripod and something that goes on top. But again, that can be a bit much. Sitting on the ground sounds like a good idea, except for the part where I live in Florida and there are fire ants <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, so for the longest time, I had, I had a backpack, which is more like a passenger. Like, oh, what do you call it? I forget what you call it, but it's, it slings around, and then it's got this big flap, and the mm -hmm. big flap has like plastic on the side here. And so I just put it down and then sit on that rather than sit on the ground <laughs> the ground was wet or something like that stupid fun i like the, i like the idea of the tripod things because this is what i'm seeing everybody do these days is they're getting these cute little 3d printed palettes and workspaces and stuff that are all like super tiny and minimal and they have that universal screw in connector in the bottom that snaps yeah. into a photo tripod the play that i'm seeing a lot of people go with and i want to give this a try the really small collapsible tripod and then having the screw in base to be able to create a small work area. It's, and I, I could see really you, way if you're going to do it. I, I could see like those little, the little tray that you have fitting nicely on that. Cause I ended up having to post up with the entire easel and I needed like a park bench with a table on it in order to lay out <laughs> all my stuff. I'm like, I don't think this is how people do it. I don't think this is the play. Uh, and, and the other thing is when it, when it comes 
to this is, is minimizing the amount of colors that you use. And the really cool thing is you really don't need many colors in mm -hmm. order to create a really big wide gamut. And so, yeah, like, like, like really just these, these are my main ones. And then I have some convenience colors up here on the side. You know, let's see what's on this guy. And so once you have that, you know, cause, cause I do see people come out with like, they bring a bag of paints you know, try and try and bring like <laughs> a million different colors. They haven't really learned to mix paint yet. Well, this is how this is how my wife is with watercolor because I feel like watercolor is one of those mediums where it benefits from having a lot of supply of different paints. And so her favorite thing for travel is to have a small tray that's just like a little tiny tin that each paint well is like microscopic, but there's like 30 of them inside of a little <laughs> mint tray. And that seems really great for her. But when it comes to something that's easier, to, that's a little bit goopier and easier to mix like acrylic or with gouache, I, I've been getting by with just five colors uh, as a basic palette. Like the, the starter set for the Windsor Newtons have like a mixing set that comes with, I think, five colors. It seems like an expert would be able to do well with that. It's actually my biggest weakness when it comes to traditional painting is that um, I'm used to having a color picker. The palette is is got to be the point where I feel least comfortable doing this sort of thing. Yeah, so um, in, in, in the course, we have, for the majority of the weeks, just a little section where essentially we're, we're just mixing color. <laughs> just mixing color. So the, you, we go to, go to um, I think we have a list somewhere of all of the different colors that we're using. If you want to follow one exactly, you essentially go to a hardware store. Still, like the color, you know, the little color things you do to put up on your wall. Yeah, the little right? color chart for the wall. Yeah, and then and then work your way through to match the color. There's a there's a series of of questions that you ask yourself, and essentially you want to find the closest color that you have to it, or you know, it might be two colors and mix them together, and then you get it to the right value. Once you're at the right value, you kind of shift to where you need to be. And then you get to the right saturation. I might go in between these things, but um, yeah, once once you've been through that a number of times, uh, as tedious as it sounds, honestly, like mixing is a superpower. And once you can get it, then you don't have to think about it anymore. But once you can get yeah. it, yeah, I, I feel like it's a super weakness for me. I I feel like um, it's the big flashing red spot on me as a boss monster where I'm going to get shot. It's like. <laughs> I'm so bad at it. And part of that is that I've never done one of those color charts. I'm just like, I'll figure it out. Like I always run headlong into it and just want to start making the painting. And I've never done any of this kind of focused study on color charts. Are you talking think... about it as like the path to me being able to actually have that as an ability? Yeah, it's yeah, super yeah. appealing to me because yeah. I want to be able to do this. Let me let me make a clarification. You're talking about um, color, like, like here's this color and this color, I'm making a chart. Um, and, and that is really tedious. I don't do that. I, but, but getting the questions so that you have the framework so mm -hmm. that you can do it no matter what colors you have, I think that's, that's the real key. And if you were to want to put like five minutes aside, um, so for example, if you wanted to, if you wanted to try and so like you're, get So what you're saying is you have, a, you have a system for teaching how to find a color swatch that is not just building these kind of rote large like color charts that people are used that's to right seeing. that's right wrote wrote is my enemy but let's say you have like two blues or three blues and two yellows mm -hmm. this is the only time that i'd really want to make a color chart is if it's mm -hmm. attached to a project and something that you really want to do and it's only going to take you five minutes beforehand to get prepared putting those that okay so i have like two blues and two yellows and trying to find the grid of this blue plus this yellow oh okay so that one that one doesn't end up in the the right hue that i want or like this blue and the other yellow, that one's much closer. And so then I'm gonna go for that. Like, I hate the big color charts because of how, because of the tedium, it's just not my style. But a lot of your work is you painting in a live environment, whether you're yeah. painting food out at a restaurant or like yeah. going out to the forest, you're doing painting as an action. You're not just doing it as some sort of procedural thing in a, you know, in a huge library or whatever, just to like, you know, catalog, what can these paints do? You're trying to, to do something with them. And yeah, do something with it. I'm not somebody who's very big on preparing either. So this is all very appealing to me. And <laughs> part of that not preparing is I haven't looked ahead. I don't, I haven't looked to see what's in your course. I haven't read <laughs> through any of the emails carefully. I haven't uh, looked into any kind of preparatory materials you sent over. I have a finite amount of time that I spend in my email every day that I can kind of bear to deal with digging through emails. And so 
I haven't done any preparation. I've set aside a little bit of time to get over that and look at what I actually need to do to get ready for this class over the course of the next really much few days. That you need to do to get ready for it. Okay, good. That's <laughs> really just good. making sure you have the right stuff and you have a you have a stay wet palette and you have the paints and you have paint paint brushes. You're you're going to be good. I, I do. I'm prepared. Good. I do recommend like if you're just starting out, using a stay wet palette can be really helpful um, mm -hmm. because it keeps the values where you know they're going to be uh, mm -hmm. instead of drying. Uh, and so you can ha you can be working on a wet painting and have wet paint, and it kind of works together really well. You don't have to worry about it drying. We do have some questions. How can you fix the paper sheet so that it doesn't wrinkle when you start painting? This always happens to me, even if I fix the paint uh, to a board with a paper tape. Okay, so this is buckling. Buckling happens when there's an uneven distribution of water. So essentially, if this is your paper, this side's wet, this side's not wet, uh, this side's going to expand, and this side's going to, it's not going to contract, but it's not going to expand. And so then you get sort of these, these bucklings back and forth because there's an uneven distribution of water. You can do things like put it under tension, but probably the easiest, um, not exactly foolproof, but the, the most amount of progress you can make with that is to actually wet both sides of the paper before you begin. So when you apply paint, there's no longer an uneven distribution of water uh, until things start to dry and then it'll, there'll be a little buckling. But uh, it, changes, it changes this from being like a really big problem to being mm -hmm. something you can cope with. Yeah. There's, there's some big myths right off the bat, like don't use black. I think mm -hmm. that's rubbish. Um, give everything a color identity, which means that your, everything lives in a family of colors. Like this is a blue. But if you need that black to get to where that blue needs to be, then use it. Like, let's pull up something like this guy again. What is this? painting like it's just a tree <laughs> but, but it's, it's, it's just not a tree. tree it's how i felt when i looked at that tree right and to a lot of people it like and 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 that's all and that's it i didn't add anything cool in it i didn't add any fantasy elements i didn't add anything i just there's not even one cool the... guy with a sword not even no, one not even one if you look close enough there's one in the background but um yeah there, there's like it, it, is it is it a thing that I'm attracted to? Cool. That's that's all I need. And then, yeah. and then, but it's not. It's not. It, that's on the like emotional side of thing. But on in the practice, everything, especially when you're working traditionally, is a it's a two way conversation. And you could try and force everything. And and gouache has the ability to force things because you can paint as many layers as you want. You can just keep going. So you can force something. But the better paintings are always the paintings where the gouache, the, the paint itself has something to say. That, that's the magical mm -hmm. thinking, maybe, is that I'm, I'm putting this thing down and I'm like, that's not what I wanted. But if, so long as I can pause and be like, that's actually kind of cool. Like, uh, well, what how is can the, I, how yeah, what is the paint telling me it wants right now? It's yeah, like, what's the paint doing? maybe it sounds a little magical, but yeah. you know, when you open yourself up to it and you actually try that. I don't know. Like I, I have very little experience with traditional media, and I've always thought about this, even as a digital artist, that the painting does speak back to you to a certain degree and tells you what it needs. Yeah. Put away all the reference. Stop trying to impose yourself too much on it. Look to see what it's actually doing, and then ask, you know, how can I help? That feels really good. Like it, and yeah. then the results are good too. But uh, you know, uh, one of the people in chat here, uh, Philip, saying it's um, try try less to be cool to actually be cool is a tough lesson but like <laughs> try is. to not master the painting but like be there as a collaborator for the painting it, it it sounds questionable whether or not it's a practical lesson but i'm convinced that it is it absolutely is no it's really hard it is hard but like i think so long as if you're trying to be cool and you could probably substitute the word cool for some other re more relevant word for you it's uh, a really useless word. If you're trying so hard to get somewhere, then the problem is you just stop listening. You mm -hmm. stop actually seeing what's there. And yeah, like, you, like you said, some of the, the worst paintings that come through my classes or people that I'm helping and critiquing are the paintings where they're just reference locked. They're just locked mm -hmm. in. And you have to be like, stop it. Put away the reference. 
ask how is the painting working? What's taking your attention that you don't care about? Well, that, that really shouldn't be taking your attention. Like, tone that down. Or what, like, start treating this like it's talking to you and then tone down the things that you, you don't want it to say and then bring the reference back and like, you know, there's this just, just constant jump between what does the reference say and then what am I trying to say and what's the paint trying to say and it's this like three-way conversation that I think is really cool. It is really cool. I find the point where I end up missing the conversation the most is I, have a, I tend to have um, tunnel vision in a lot of things. <laughs> I find myself kind of tunneling in on my expectations for the painting. And then I look up and I look at the reference and I'm like, uh-oh, like it, it actually, <laughs> the, the environment doesn't look anything like that. Or I've, I've gotten the proportions of this thing way wrong. Do you have any insight into how to deal with this kind of tunnel vision of like getting the sense, the larger sense of the thing that's in front of you without like kind of tunneling in on just like one leaf or whatever? I actually think when, so, so this is actually a, a difference that happens when you're working traditionally versus digitally, at least for me, mm -hmm. I, take, I take four times as long to make a digital painting than I do to make a traditional painting. And the reason is because I can just go in, I can hone in, I can zoom, I can like be there, I can go back, I can go forward. When you're working- I've watched people really mess themselves up that zoom tool, but I love it. Yes. <laughs> That's my best when friend. You're, when you're working traditionally, you always have the big picture in front of you. That, yeah, mm -hmm. you can get my off it. You certainly can. In a way, and, and then the pain is doing things and you can't go back and you kind of, I, there, there is something about working traditionally, at least in gouache, you know, maybe not in oil. I know people spend forever on oil, uh, but gouache is so fast because it's dry and then you can just do the next thing. But yeah, there's something in that that helps me to, to not get in my opic. So, and then the other thing is, process oriented is like so going from a big picture and getting everything sorted and and it's it's process oriented because it has to be with gouache you can you can use water and so when you're using water and then you paint into that water you get nice soft transitions and then as it dries your transitions you're going in and out of forms and in and out of uh, brush strokes gets hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter and so mm. you have to be like, okay, if I want a soft transition, it's happening at the beginning. <laughs> there's, really? ways to force it. there's ways to force it. Like you can come back in or you can change your process up a bit so that I'm working on this tree and it's, it's wet. And so any of the big form changes, best to do that at the beginning. Because I was like getting, when I was laying in these strokes, I was getting these crisp edges, these nice wet edges. And I was like, well, if I can get an edge that tight right at the beginning, then the the in, I I assumed it was going to be the inverse because I was like, well, I can screw these up, I can blend these out, but I if I come in with a perfectly dry, clean page and I make just the right stroke, I can get this perfect pool of pigment that has this perfect edge to it. And I thought like, that that's is... where I need to like go to define this stuff. But without any context laid out, without a drawing done prior, I'm like, how am I supposed to get the proportions of the scene right when I can't kind of work my way up to it? If I'm supposed to be nailing these edges right at the beginning, the idea of like working on it loosely, yeah. broadly, like in a blurry way at first and then tightening in later sounds so a lot the, better. The other, the, the other thing is when, when you're doing this is that it's a lot easier to work on top of transparent paint just because there's less paint. So you're mm -hmm. less likely to reactivate it, everything. And so a lot of people essentially do just a transparent pass first to get that big image, get the, the, the proportions and everything, and then come in thick to the top. Um, and that, that's one way that you can kind of, you know, go big to small. Sometimes when you have a lot of paint on there and then you try to get even more paint on top, if you don't want to let it dry, then it's... Uh, it, it fights back against you. That's what I was getting. Yeah, okay. That makes sense. All right. <laughs> Maybe I'll bring a hairdryer with me next time. I'll be out there with like a battery and a hairdryer and I'll be spraying at the thing, trying to get it to dry faster, being impatient. Let's see. There was a question here about mixing mediums. You ever mix mediums? And they, they phrase it as, or do you respect the medium? And I'm like... <laughs> I have no respect for mediums. I have no respect for mediums. <laughs> Other than listening to them, which I think is actually rather respectful. Uh, but... No, I, I happily mix gouache and watercolors very easily. Uh, I, I think 
Oh, you know what? Like, there's some there's some actually really good paintings that I wanted to share. Uh, oh yeah, Dustin was asking if you have some paintings them. that you could share. That'd be great. Yeah, we've got some more technical questions in here, and I I want to know the answers to these, but that's kind of why I'm taking the course. Also, is like a, <laughs> there's a certain amount of practical learning that it's tough to put into an hour long live thing. We've got a few minutes left. You know, I'd love to see. I'd love to close out on some of your work because um, I think your work's incredible. And the, if I could make, like, have a real physical painting that that looks like this, that would be great. I would love to be able to share these with people. I'd love to have them around the house. This was uh, Edward Theodore Compton. It was a nineteenth century, just brilliant. Obviously, it's it's black and white, uh, but this is gouache and watercolor. Okay. Here's another one. So these are all gouache and watercolor. Some of them are more watercolor than gouache. I really just think it's like, I guess, like I said, I like mountains, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but these are like, you wouldn't think that this was gouache. You, you'd barely even think it's watercolor. Just looking at how. I, I've seen a couple of watercolorists that are able to pull this effect off, but very few. Yeah. It's beautiful. There's a lot of, uh, this one's more watercolor than gouache. Um, yeah, you can see there's some, some Zorn, some absolutely amazing uh, watercolors. And, and Sargent, and the further you go into it, the more you realize they didn't care when they were transitioning between watercolor and gouache. Mm. Just didn't care. They would just go flippantly in between them, um, which I think is just brilliant. This is gouache. So this is where we get like a really transparent paint right down here in the front. So that means they're just painting really loosely, really uh, lots of water. You can see through the paint. But the, mm -hmm. by the time you get back here, it's just 100% really thick. Um, you know, this might not be my favorite style. In practice, you wouldn't look at this and be like, oh, yeah, that's gouache. Like, it really looks like it might be oil in the back. And it mm -hmm. looks like it's watercolor on the front. And I just, every time that I think I know what gouache is, there's somebody, oh, that one's mine. There's somebody somewhere <laughs> who is pushing, uh, pushing it. And I, and I love that. Let's see, obviously, Studio Ghibli, Sid Mead. I know a lot of, ooh. Nothing. Well, they, okay, I mean, let's, let's just uh, say everybody loves Studio Ghibli. Yeah. And because the work they do is incredible. And I think that when I think of gouache, the first thing I think of is animation backgrounds. Ah. That this Studio Ghibli look is... Uh, tightly associated with gouache and i don't know if they're i think that some of the old films probably used gouache and i wonder nowadays if they're just doing it all digitally in an attempt to imitate gouache okay so studio ghibli is all gouache it's still all gouache still all gouache yeah yeah even the boy and his heron all gouache oh my god um they well they use poster color but like i said before same thing we've got a whole bunch of they can't beat it you know can't beat it. yeah i <laughs> yeah. beat it well, I mean, it's, it's their it's their thing. Like they mm -hmm. they're going to spend as long as it takes. But, but you're saying that it's the same thing that we we associate these with, like green pastoral scenes. That these sort of gritty '80s and yeah. '90s anime backgrounds that these, I also these, adore this style. I love. Yeah, this I know. Style. You, I, I actually I picked this out because I knew you were an anime background fan or not. Yeah, anime. it's like uh, Cowboy Bebop. Just all of yeah. this stuff is. If you go to the store and pick up gouache. This is what you're capable of. I mean, this is what I miss out of anime nowadays. I, I like this to me is like sort of peak for the genre is when you have the cell shading over the top of these very moody, oh, yeah. very, um, you know, there's this painterly sense, this hand touched sense to them. And I, I don't think that I think there's something missing in a lot of the the um, the more digital looking work that we see in modern animation. It's exciting to me to know that like, yeah, Studio Ghibli agrees and that they've decided that even when I went to go see the boy and the heron in theaters a couple weeks ago, that like they're keeping the torch lit, that they still think that this is the best as, you know, as good as it gets. And uh, yeah. makes me think that maybe I've got taste. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree but, with that. This is again, like, like you come in here, this is, this like okay. concrete stuff i have done yeah. spent a lot of time faking this digitally so it, it is actually it's difficult right so a lot mm -hmm. of this is very transparent you can see watermarks in here that they've kind of intentionally left in 
And then I've had to go and paint in all those wet edges by hand, going and trying to trace all of the artifacts that are created naturally by gouache. Yeah, I mean, it's just the, the the thing is, it's just so much more versatile. Like you look at this, and then you look at those mountain paintings that we we're first looking at, and you'd be like, "Yeah, same thing, same thing, same thing." And I think that's just amazing. But yeah, I have some some little videos. So this is the this is the tree one. Right, if we come back here, that was fast. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, like I said, gouache is fast. So no, this is done in three, uh, two and a half hours. Oh wow. Two and a half hours. So I, I come in at the beginning with a lot of a lot of transparent, a lot of water. There's just like bright yellow uh, being transmitted by the leaves that you just don't get um, super opaquely. Mm -hmm. So bringing in a lot of that, and then spending the rest of the painting trying to tone it down. Um, no, but um, so here I'm coming in with a lot of thick paint and using uh -huh. it really wet, lots of water just to try and get that kind of natural effect. So I, I normally spend a lot of paintings trying to have a, a double standard for myself, which I'm really happy with, which is that I want to get it as good as humanly possible in the first pass, mm -hmm. um, knowing that I probably will come back over and fix it over. But you can see like little tendrils, little things like this. This, this, mm -hmm. this is what we're talking about, like natural conversation between me and the paint. And seeing if I can keep as much of that as, as possible. And then being okay if I have to come back over the top. And you know, it's a classic social media post right there. <laughs> um, they make good posts. It's, it's like so easy to shoot a painting. If you get a nice sunny spot in your house, to just make it yeah. look like so cozy. So yeah, in, in this I use a pretty classic wet to dry. Everything was wet at the beginning. And I'm I, like over here, I'm not working on any details. I'm just thinking mm -hmm. about like, how do I communicate that big roundness of the tree? And then by the time at the end, everything's pretty well dry. I'm using thick, heavy, uh, dry paint and getting in the smaller forms and the smaller details. And um, I'm so excited to try this. Do you, they do little washes over the top to try to get little, uh, like build the gradients on top of those like drier forms? You can, you absolutely can. The big thing you want to do with that is um, let it dry completely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't let it dry completely, you just yeah. like start destroying yourself. Just turn all the edges to mush. Your food paintings look incredible, Ben. I, whenever I see the posts pop up on Instagram, I always think like the, my first reaction, my initial reaction is like, oh, that looks like a great piece of food. And then I see you like <laughs> zoom back out and like, I'm like, oh wait, it was it it's not a photorealistic painting, but it captures the essence of it so clearly that my impression of it is like as a as the thing that it is, is as opposed to like a painting of it. And then like, you know, I kind of get shaken out of it, both both by the process of watching you make it, but also just by like further examination. And that that sense of naturalism, that like instant impression of naturalism is something that like I'm honestly a little bit intimidated by because I know you've been able to pull it off really effectively with your food paintings. And I'm like, I don't think I can do that. Like, I, I'm like convinced in advance that I don't know how and I can't do it. But um, I'm game to try. I don't know how I don't I don't expect them to be a master after eight weeks working with right, you. Right, right. But I really want to get going on this so that I have the next 10 years to mess around with this on my spare time. Yeah, so, so I, I, I set it up because I know like eight weeks is not enough for anything really, right? No. <laughs> so the idea is that we're, we're going we're gonna to spend eight weeks not getting things perfect, but like as a roadmap of me telling you how to do the things. And I, I normally mm -hmm. put in more information than you can really take in one, in one sitting mm -hmm. and then you'll have access to it forever. So like if you ever want to come back and, and, oh yeah, what were we talking about and how do we, how do, we do that and... I know for me, when I listen to or, or watch a lot of things, I'll be like, oh, yeah, I know what they're talking about. And then six months later, I'm working on a painting. I'm like, oh, that's what they were talking about. And then two years later, I'll be like, oh, no, this is what they're talking about. Anyway, it's all the same thing. But it's, mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's just learning happens in a way that you, you just don't get it in a single, a single session. Yeah, so in the... in. Generally, we, we go over an idea 
and then do so sort of like very very immediate exercises about that idea and then at the end we'll do a painting and so when we're going through that painting we'll talk about the idea but we'll also talk about just making the painting in general um and that's kind of when we'll talk a lot more about the textual when do you do this when do you not do it when when is helpful when is harmful you know that kind of thing trying to find Again, in, in theory, a lot of the things that we've been talking about, where the paint's going to do what the paint does. And so your job, not always to force yourself on the paint, your, your job is to, especially when you're just learning, is to spend that time cataloging, okay, when I do this, it does that. And then like save that in your brain, because one day you want that end result. And then, and then you can be like, okay, so this is what I did, right? Um, and so working in that way where there is no right, there is no wrong. The minute you start judging your own art and like there is a, there's obviously a, a, a way of judging that you have to do that's like, I want this and I want that. But the minute you start being like, oh, I did it wrong, I did it wrong. You stop being able to see what you did. You stop being able to like then turn around and be able to replicate that when you actually do want it. And mm -hmm. so... That Mustard. those mountain paintings you were showing us earlier, this I like. I don't think it's possible to get that kind of detail and fidelity by simply looking better by just using your eyes better on the landscape. Like it feels like it has to come from an interplay with like you know what's happening on the page, what's what the painting is doing, and and working directly with the painting because so much information. There's no way to like pass yeah. it all into your brain fully. And then download your, from your brain to the page. It like it has to. There has to be a part of it that lives in the page. Yes, I also I also think a lot about it in terms of so so like we were talking about earlier. Like you were saying earlier, and earlier in my life, to me, you can't intellectualize everything. Like you mm -hmm. you have to stop intellectualizing everything. And so I've sort of transitioned that into this idea of feeding my intuition. Especially when you have kids, you start to realize that you don't learn anything and like you don't know anything intuitively. I had to teach my kids to eat, I had to teach your kids to sleep, like nothing is intuitive. And so you get into this idea of you have to spend that time making terrible mistakes and feeding your intuition. You have to do it enough that then you can not think about it and then you can be responsive to what you're seeing and to what you're doing in, with, with your paint. Uh, but yeah. I've been having this theory recently, and I want to test it out more and more with students, is that the, the aspiration ultimately is to, is to be aware of what's happening, to have a feeling of like, oh, I like this, I don't like this, to actually just focus on the awareness of what feedback you're getting from yourself and from your medium and from the work. Because it's like, it's when you close yourself off to being like, no, 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 actually, I do like the way that looks. Or because that's the way it should be. Right. Um, but like instead being like, oh, I, I don't like that. Oh, I actually love that. Like being, a, being aware of the positive and negative experiences that you're having throughout the session, that the practice, like being aware of like your own reactions to that is the thing that ultimately creates learning. Both the positive, being permeable to both the positive and negative experiences that we're having while we work allows us to make corrections and like yeah. stick to the things that are working and reject the things that are not working by being like by just allowing those experiences to happen and make sure that we're we're feeling them as they're as they're happening because it creates it's that feedback loop that that corrects us over time and it's i think that some of the thing that that stifles people in their learning is this um desire to want to have a particular experience and overriding the things that are really happening inside their own minds and like erasing that presence because they they want to be better. They want they like you want to be good. You want your pain to be good. And you don't want to feel pain or discomfort. And so we, you know, we shut ourselves down to to our awareness while we're working. And it's um it's a it's a problem. It, it and like by maintaining a level of awareness and just allowing things to be good and allowing things to be bad and having a sort of lightness about it um you know, potentially has the ability to allow us to learn. That's the theory I have, but I, I, I don't have a ton of proof behind I it. I think that's that's more than just an art theory. That's like a life theory. Like, 
Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> in my experience. Where do you want to end this? We are over an hour, and I don't want to keep too much of your time. Yeah, okay. So here, let me show something here. I don't, I don't really go into this idea of, of mixing media, but I do... All right, I'm just going to find... Well, what, what media mixes well with gouache? Oh, watercolor is just the, the really natural um, answer to that, right? Because it, it is, so for this, like, I'm putting down, let's see, putting down this little sky. It's going to sort of fade into almost nothing right here. Mm -hmm. And it may as well be watercolor. It could just yeah. be watercolor. Um, and then I'm going to do this kind of thing over here. And this could be a really thick watercolor. It's got enough paint in it that it's going to um, not keep quite that same transparency. It's going to get really matte in it. Um, anyway, so, so there's this sense of if you don't want that matte finish at the end, if you want a bit more of a jewel-like quality to it, you can come back in with watercolor or, or use watercolor instead. A lot of people will use watercolor first and then gouache mm -hmm. second because gouache, you know, will just paint over the top. But there's a lot of ideas in the culture and practice of watercolor, which are really, really cool, um, that are not present in m what most people talk about when they're, when they're dealing with gouache. You know, yeah, most there's a lot of technique that you can develop with watercolor that it does all sorts of weird effects. Yeah. And then there's a lot of people, honestly, most people, most people using gouache, would just do just giant, chunky, fat, thick paint. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But it's, um, yeah, I, I like to work. There's nothing into, wrong with it. There's nothing, like nothing work, at all. <laughs> I like to work into the full breadth of what my paint can do. Mm -hmm. uh, Does anything work over the top of it? Do you, can you just like, if you want to get really into the nitty gritty, can you just like pull out the colored pencils and start yep. like scraping into it? Yep, you can do colored pencils on top, any kind of pencils on top. Um, you could probably see. throw acrylic over it because acrylic's just plastic. You just like coat plastic over the top of it all day if you really yeah. wanted to. The, so the hard part about working over top of gouache is that it's going to reactivate. Mm. Um, so if so it with water to... in it, it could potentially gum it up. Yes, and if you if you're if you're quick enough, then you're not spending that time like really digging into the paint and completely reactivating. Um, is there, but think, you could seal it down. Like you could probably put a, like a transparent medium over the top if you really wanted to get mixed media with it. You can. Um, the problem is that, um, so there's, there's this, there's this, um, physical property called, um, internal reflection, which is essentially mm -hmm. saying that, uh, the light, when, when there's a reflective surface, the light comes down. And we'll go back up. And because it's a reflective surface, it actually reflects this way as well as that way. And so mm -hmm. there's going to be some part of it that reflects inside the shininess, essentially, of it. And so it gets darker. There's less light that comes out. And which is why watercolor isn't going to, you know, when you use dark watercolor, it's not going to lift up quite as bright. Um, oh, it's not going to lift up quite as much. But if you use gouache, it essentially changes in value the most because it's completely matte. And so you add something that's going to protect it, um, or you add something that allows you to paint on top, and then your, the values come down. Like the light values come down and the dark values come up and they kind of meet in the middle. And this actually, it, it's a matter of how do you think about it, because it can be really frustrating. Or mm -hmm. you can see it as an, as an opportunity to be subtle. Or wow. or flatten it out a little bit as you're going to go and you know add another medium on top that's going to push the range on it. Yeah, I but actually have a. Paint. There's have something a... about the matte quality of the gouache that I think in person is something you can't express to the screen, but I think in person it creates this really strong effect of being like exactly what it is. It's like this. Yeah. You know, you don't have you don't have a lot of like glare over the top of it. You see it, and it's just like it's like a perfect print of itself but it is a perfect print of itself mm -hmm. all right so like the 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 it's getting a scan of a gouache painting so easy 
It's the easiest. Thing. <laughs> Getting a good a good copy of an oil painting is the hottest thing in the world. Oh my god! Um, uh, just about every medium, you you end up having to photograph half of them because a scanner will just not work on them. It's but you can just throw a gouache painting in a scanner. Yeah, I just throw it in the scanner. I have That's a, awesome. have an Epson E six hundred, and it scans up to twelve hundred DPI, mm -hmm. which is amazing. All right, so with this painting, this painting, I wanted some really subtle values down here. Uh, and because gouache, uh, like we talked about, like it, like it dries a little bit different, it's actually really hard to get some of these nice soft um, and, and really subtle value changes. And so with this painting, I actually made it in casein first. Casein mm. has got a, a milk binder and does not reactivate. But at the same time, it accepts gouache over it really well. So like a, a lot of the times that you use a medium, like use acrylic, right? And then the acrylic is water resistant. So you go gouache over the top and it'll beat up and everything. Um, and so this one I did, did casein underneath to just be able to work some of these values through. And then did really small washes in, in these light areas over here. And something like this, this is just gouache over the top, complete smothering of what was underneath. Um, but yeah, if sometimes, and I've only done this like once or twice, if I really want, if, I, if the painting is relying on some super subtle values, um, I might use casein underneath. And then I have another painting, which is this guy, which is, I, I kind of just began it and got to this point and I was like, you know what? I want this to be a lot more, it's, it's big and it needs, it's relying on a lot of control in here. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to come on top. I'm going to put a layer of something over the top and then probably oil paint over the top of it. And we'll see how that goes. <laughs> cool. I, the other thing that sprung to mind is because this, this stuff's easy to scan, it's doable to work with it digitally a lot easier than yeah. something like oil. So like you could do a spend half a day on a gouache painting, toss it in the scanner, and then use it as background for animation project or an illustration project and like use it collaboratively along with digital tools if it's something you're you're um you know you have experience with. I don't have specific plans for that myself, but I could see how Somebody who really wants that natural hand touched feel, who's really who's working on something with games or animation, could have these like really integrate these very easily. I mean, ah, like the, I, the I, classic I, use case is like background environments for animation where they're photographing it. And so, like laying it out with a sheet of uh, plastic over the top, I mean, that's the way that we're used to seeing this stuff. Yeah, it's true. All right, let's go look through some of these questions. Difference between tube and pans. Do you, yeah. you, you seem to like the pans. I like the pans because they're convenient. Mm -hmm. um, there is, you were talking about your friend using gouache and some really nice thick impasto over the top. Um, and that's easier when you're coming straight from a tube. Just because all of the paint that's there is just sitting there ready to go. Um, Coming from a pan, you might get some like dry brushing, some really nice thick dry brushing. Again, ultimately, just because it's not all there ready to go, it, it's it's thick, and you're just grabbing the pot that's like thick and gooey, and you can put it over the top. Um, there really is not much of a big difference. There really isn't. I would, if you're going to buy something, I would not buy and gouache, just because you can grab tube gouache and put it in a pan and that's great um i think that's what i'm gonna do yeah. i got the tubes i'm sure i've got a pan around here i'm gonna steal one of anya's <laughs> gotta be dirt cheap if it's at the art supply store down the street yeah the, 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 these like in pans are really cheap
Yeah, so the big difference between uh, acrylic gouache and traditional gouache is essentially just the fact that it's not going to reactivate. Mm. Um, and so it's going to dry, and then it dries. And then you can paint another layer over the top of it. It does mm. have a slightly different texture. Um, and this is, again, it's one of these things that I don't have anything against acrylic gouache, but I just don't use it. And I don't need to use it because I'm, I, 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 I'm at a point where I can really predict what's going to happen with my gouache. Why mess with that? <laughs> um, but there's also ways that you can you know, re-wet a painting and work into it. Um, but no, so th that is really just the big difference. That's it. Uh, the other thing is it's not going, it, you can't travel with it like this in the same way. Because once it's dry, it's dry. It doesn't reactivate. You can't take it out mm. somewhere and do some plain air. You have to be worried about how dry is it right now. Um, I think that's how I was expecting it to be. And that's how I was preparing for it the, my first time out is treat oh. it as though it were acrylic wash. Right. So that yeah. makes sense. I feel like I'm getting it now. I'm, I'm yeah. excited to give it a try. I have a, I have a suspicion I'm going to end up going back to acrylic wash and giving that a, a try because something about the sort of permanent drying of it reminds me of working digitally. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm excited to get into this. This is, a, this is brand new territory for me. Um, any brands you would recommend for gouache, watercolor, oil paint? What, I mean, we said this is a medium that maybe benefits significantly from buying the right brands. Yeah, okay. So um, Windsor Newton, they're good. Holbein, they're good. You just need to make sure that, you're, that you know if you're buying acrylic or uh, traditional when it comes to Holbein. Uh, because they do acrylic, and you don't want to accidentally get one when you want the other. Um, M. Graham, this M. Dot Graham, is good. Um, and these are available at every major art supply store. Wash is so hard to find. Really? Um, well, they're, they're like like Hobby Lobby has its own brand of gouache, and then you just won't find any other kinds of gouache there. They're not like oil or watercolor, where it's like you walk in and it's like, these are the different brands, right? Well, I'm we never going to shop at Hobby Lobby ever again for that reason specifically. Uh, Summer Dragon S says Blick is the best place in the US to find good gouache. And I would believe it. Blick's great. Uh, I, I, don't Blick. Have, I don't have Blick near me, like an actual stool. I'm not sure oh. they have. Do they have actual stores? Yes. They smell amazing. <laughs> oh, I wish. Jerry's Adorama is one that's. Mm -hmm. five hours for me but it's amazing oh my god um yeah i don't have one near me i i literally only have hobby lobby and michaels and so jerry's and blick are pretty me. similar i think i okay. i have I've been fortunate to live near blick when i was living in chicago i lived near several i got to visit many locations and i just i love going in there and wandering around even, even as somebody who does, doesn't do a lot of traditional <laughs> painting god so they, like i feel like it's one of the great luxuries of life is to wander through the art supply store. I recommend it to anybody who hasn't done it recently. And it's really good. I'm jealous. And then, yeah, so we have Nika Posticolor, which you'll have to order them online if, if that's a thing that you want. This is literally what they use in the, all the Ghibli and um, you know, Cowboy Bebop and, and all of those anime backgrounds. Um, again, that's it's not actually... That's a big selling point. It is a big that's selling point. So the, the one thing that you have to watch with these, as, as well as you actually have to watch this with everything, uh, but especially these, is that these are specifically made for um, reproduction. Like, you're going to put it down, they're going to take a photo of it, and that means they don't care if it's not light fast or not. Uh, which, you know, light fast is just UV damage, mm -hmm. not the, the color will change. And so, my suggestion is if you have anything, do the research up front 
you know, buy, buy whatever you buy, do the research, see how light fast it is. And for anything that's not like top light fastness, put some washi tape around it so you can see it and you can know it. Because <laughs> you don't want to, you don't want to do something that you're going to sell and have it be not light fast. Um, I didn't care when I was young about light fastness. And then yeah. the, as I got older, I got to watch prints that I had given to friends age in their house. And I was like, yeah, horrified. <laughs> <laughs> did not realize that i would watch things degrade in my own lifetime over the course of even just a few years as right. some stuff really and it, what's funny is we actually have gotten originals not naming names but we we've got originals from people where the pain is continued to react after the fact where uh mixed media pieces where like stuff started oh, to rise yeah. Yeah. up through the piece uh just because you know uh when you're using mixed media, like different things settle at different heights because they're, and they will actually, you'll actually watch like a pencil drawing start to reemerge back through a painting if it's not sealed <laughs> down. Uh, and all kinds of crazy crap like that. Like uh, I haven't had done a lot of experience with it personally, but it's so easy to just discount because we live in this like short term in the moment kind of environment. Yeah. And then you just, you watch it like, change over time and realize, wait a minute, where are all these lines coming from? Oh, yeah, if you should probably you, seal your drawings down. If Because I understand not having the headspace to, like, really think about it. If that's you, or anyone listening, focus on reds first. Like, mm -hmm. look at your reds. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of red, like, opera red is just going to just destroy a pink's. Um, oh, the, the really regular one that everyone uses that shouldn't be using is, oh, what it's called? What's it called? Clearly I'm, I'm blanking on it right now. It's. Oh, does pencil come, does, does anything come up through gouache? Does, do you have a problem with things relayering with gouache? They, or what, like, do you have to seal that pencil drawings happened. down? No. Mm -hmm. No, the, the, it's actually more of a problem that you'll put a pencil, you'll lay a pencil down and then it'll just disappear. <laughs> the pencil will because, sink because through the gouache like, like uh, quicksand? Uh, no, not that you'll put it over top, but mm -hmm. just that um, gouache by its nature is quite opaque. And so you'll put something down and, oh, I lost my pencil. Oh, well. Uh, but no, I've never, <laughs> had, I've never had pencil come back up. But then again, at the same time, I... Oh, wait. Mm -hmm. uh, some dragons are saying up. gouache eats pencil. So... If you put pencil on top of it, it might, or maybe maybe she's that. saying the same thing that you're saying. But yeah, like uh, it's one of those things. Oh, oh underneath. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. But I, I would I would think that's funny if you just draw on it, and it like slowly sinks like through quicksand and just disappears and sinks to the bottom of your paint ocean, never to be seen again. Drawing going down to Davy Jones's locker. Yeah, don't spit on it. <laughs> don't have it across from you. Moisture. Right, exactly, exactly. No, I mean, it's, it's not going to do anything. I, I don't have it in, in direct sunlight, so it could sit there for years, and it'll just be what it is right now. Um, so long as I don't let it get old and moldy, then it'll be good. Um, good question. The, 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 the color that I was thinking was alizarin crimson. It's a color that's like in, in all of these like starter packs, and it'll just change. So you, you have to get either permanent alizarin crimson or swap out for quinacridone and magenta, which is my favorite. Anyway. It's no is the answer. Just because, like we were talking about earlier, I don't the way that I operate, at least have trained myself to operate, is not 
um, is not this color plus this color equals exactly this thing. It's about asking the questions and getting it to where it needs to be, no matter what pigment I'm using. Um, and for that reason, I just genuinely, generally don't care. I don't find them to operate completely differently. Um, and most of the things that I get annoyed at, like lemon yellow is going to be super transparent, but it's going to be super transparent no matter who makes it, because it's more about what minerals are inside it rather than um, you know, what they're doing to those minerals. Yeah, because uh, so, there's yeah. so much about color that's the, the color theory, but then when it comes to physical pigments, there are practical materials that need to be either crushed out of bugs or crushed out of the earth yeah. in order, or like out of a tree or something in order to form these pigments. And they have different chemical properties and they have different levels of like transparency and stuff based off of like, you know, what, what are the base materials that go into this? Cause the, there is no, this isn't Minecraft, you know, there's just it's not, not like a, it, it, you know, we just don't have pure pigment. It's not a, it's not a natural element. Yeah. So, so if I were to boil down, you know, we're talking about how a lot of a lot of you guys here are digital artists, and if I was to boil down two things to focus on when you're using gouache, that like if you can get these two things, then gouache just unlocks itself. Is number one is that it's all about the water. It's all about learning how much water to put in and what effect that has, um, and and being aware of how much water is already on the page, already in the paint. If you can get your head around water, super helpful. And the second thing that you just don't have to care about in digital, in the same way that you do, is transparency. I remember when I started doing traditional, and I was thinking about, it was even hard to get my head around, like, what is transparency? Like, what's the difference if something's opaque, if something's transparent? Like, I know technically what it is, but cares. And then I went and had years of just struggling to get things to come out consistently for me because I wasn't, I had no one, no one was talking about transparency and opacity. Um, and so if you can put the time in to really getting your head around transparency and opacity, it doesn't matter which one you're doing. You just need to be like, okay, I'm going to do something and I want it to come out transparently. Do it. I'm going to do something and I want it to come out opaquely. Do it. And if it didn't come out opaquely, if it came out transparently, then adjust. And so once you get that skill down of having it come out transparently or opaquely, or even consistently somewhere in the middle, um, if it's what you want it to happen, um, then it's, that's what you want. Um, and that one skill is go so much further than you possibly think in helping the paint to come out the way that you want it to come out, even if it's a characteristic that you're not really familiar with. First question. What was the first question? Does a gouache go bad? Does it go bad? Okay, yeah. Um, so there's two things that can happen. Two things that can happen. One to be more aware of, and then the other one to be aware of eventually. The first one is it can mold. Um, and so my suggestion is that either use it all the time. Use it a little bit every day. You're not going to, there will be no mold. Or at least spread no the spores growth. around. You just got to keep yeah, the spores yeah, yeah. moving. Just keep it going. Keep it moving. You're going to be good. Um, or let it dry out completely. Like, like one of those two. Use it all the time or let it dry. And, and, and we're talking about like pans. You're going to let it dry. You know, like this is never going to mold. You don't have to worry about this. It's just if you're leaving it out. But if you're leaving it out, it's not going to mold overnight. It's not going to mold. It's going to mold in. Two or three weeks. Yeah, I was just uh, my stay wet palette that I put together. I should probably go clean that out. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Okay, so that's, that's the first one. The second one is, like I said before, if you have something, and, and this is unlikely to happen in something like this that has small amounts of paint, is more likely to happen in something like this that has very large amounts of paint. If you are for years wetting it, drying it, wetting it, drying it, wetting it, drying it, wetting it, drying it, you'll essentially wear out the binder. It'll stop binding so good, and then it'll start the paint will start transferring to the opposite page. Like, it's just not going to hold quite as well. Like, it's still technically usable, and it, but, but it's, it's just going to rub off on things a little bit more easily. Um, but this is literally large amounts of paint on and off multiple times a week for years. So you probably don't have to worry about that. Um, okay, the second thing was three reasons to try going traditional if you're a digital. Uh, the first is that, uh, like we talked about before, you can go to a beautiful place and take a photo of it and just look down at your photo and it's disgusting. Like, it just, there's something about working from life that teaches you and is amazing um, and, and, and enables you to actually get more of that feeling onto the page. Because that feeling is inherently less there when it's uh, off of a photo, off of a screen. And so having something to let you go out there um, is amazing. So good. Second part is, like we said before, there's a, there's a conversation between paint and painter that doesn't quite happen in the same capacity when you're, when you're working digitally. Um, as well as for me, like I said before, I will, it will take me a quarter of the time to make a, a traditional painting than it will to make a digital painting. That might just be me. Um, I, one of the things I'm looking forward to is like, if, I don't know if you, I don't know about you, but like, I mean, you've had a lot of experience with traditional media, but there is a totally different experience of giving somebody a painting versus giving them a print. That's the true. relationship that you have with other people and your artwork changes when it's traditional. To make a little painting for a friend or as a gift or for a family member is completely different than like drawing something and then printing it out on your printer. They will feel differently about it. You will feel differently about them having it. Um, having it's even, even if it's not a career thing to, to simply be able to make this stuff, it's a, it's a way of having a relationship with other people. I think artwork is. It's more than, it's like the same thing you're talking about, except instead of just other people, it's also like yourself. Mm -hmm. When I have a sketchbook that I have been painting in for a couple of months, it's my sketchbook. Like it's, it's, yeah. there's something about it. It's precious. It's, it's beautiful. It's, it's, I don't know. I so think that. making physical art adds value to anybody's life. And I think everybody should do it. But Philip is saying that uh, he gave his wife a watercolor ornament, and it was the favorite thing that he gave her. Uh, awesome. I could see it. I, I mean, this is my experience with receiving art from other people, and you know, whether I'm buying it or receiving it as a gift. And you know, my experience with have, knowing that my art is in the possession of other people, it's like it's meaningful. Um, I, it's something I don't feel like I've had enough of in my life and my career. And I'm, you know, it's been one of my great aspirations for this theoretical time in the future where I'm retired <laughs> is that I want to be making a lot more physical paintings in part because of the way it relates to, you know, the people, the, the fact that it's a real physical thing, you know, has, it, <laughs> I yeah. see so many art students nowadays just obsessed with their iPads and they're like, can I do it on the iPad? I get I'm like, yeah, if you don't care, I guess. Well, you know, I had somebody, come up. <laughs> someone, someone asked me the other day leading up to the gouache course. And they say, can I follow along digitally? <laughs> 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 no honestness. And I was like, 
Sorry, bud. Smoke won't work for you. It's theoretically possible. I mean, but maybe I, I would strongly well, encourage people to just do the thing, you know? Cult Classic, yes, because I didn't see anything explicitly mentioned on the last page. Is there a community Discord uh, for folks to interact and share their gouache work? Yeah, yeah, we have a, a course Discord, and it's a place to share all of the things. Like, So we have kind of two tiers. One of them is feedback students, like Pete's going to be, and so we do like a weekly video thing with feedback. And then we have people who are ordered in the class, and the Discord is a place for for both to share their work and ask me questions uh, that I can just type answers to or, or get little photos or ask the other people questions. There's a lot of people in there who are, who are now really, really good at gouache. And so, um, yeah, I'm not the only resource. You can go and ask them a whole bunch of questions and they'll all have irrelevant, but you know, probably different answers, which is great. Yeah. Um, yeah, doing this along with other people is like really big. I mean, that's, I mean, we're doing this on the community Discord server, and for those of you watching on YouTube, this is on the Huckleberry Art Discord server that we're recording this live. You know, we're always trying to find ways of making this like a valuable place for people to come hang out, and um, because we believe that doing art along with other people and enriches the experience and also like deepens it and gives you access to more info, because there's only so much you can get from a single guru. Like it's a it's a community that that like learns and grows together that where people get really good, and so yeah. And one thing that I've, that I've heard a lot from people doing who buy who buy a course like this, um, so there, there, there's two things that I I can't ever provide value for, and one of them is um, just like like they'll buy the course, they'll know the material, but buy the course because they want to force themselves to do it, so they're like they're sinking money into it, and sure send money my way even though you know like that's great um but and then the second is that they're doing it with other people so they kind of have to keep doing it to feel good about themselves and they want that pressure and I, I you know like those those are really interesting things um when it comes to making something like this that i never considered oh i, I mean it's it's like there's so much information that's out there people could google stuff they could look it up on yeah. youtube but to uh, you know have a singular source of information you're curating a lot of this information for your students and uh, yeah. you've created a space for people to come together and do it together and both of those things are add a lot of value even if like the rote information is widely available like there is so much more to the experience of learning and making art than simply having the book smarts do it's it. true. It, there's a whole bunch of like prioritization that you just don't get from a list, a listicle. Mm -hmm. A list, but but we love listicles. <laughs> anyway, <so, laughs> um, <laughs> I don't want to end on that note. But um, yeah, I do want to wrap this thing up. Um, yeah, thanks for it it's been a, it's been great talking with you, Justin. Yeah, thanks for, for coming in and talking with the community here. Um, I'm really looking forward to getting started on this thing. It's like, I don't have time to do this class. I'm going to do it anyway. My plan is to complete all the assignments on time, even yeah. though I have, you know, I don't really have the bandwidth to do it. Um, but, you know, uh, me making time for this is a way of enriching my life and also hopefully helping my career. So it's worth it for me to push and stretch a little bit in order to make sure that I, I'm going to be able to do this thing. And then hopefully down the line, you know, I'm gonna do more. I'm gonna do more of these. I aspire to be learning more going forwards, and um, you know, I'm I'm very excited to be starting working with you. Well, if I could help your career half as much as you helped mine, <laughs> I'd be stoked. Great. Yeah. So my name is uh, Justin Donaldson. If you look for Justin Donaldson art anywhere, you'll find me. I'm lucky enough that if you could Google me, I am immediately there um some of them it's justin underscore donaldson underscore art uh, but if you type justin donaldson art in whatever social media you want you'll find me <laughs> yes thank you yeah look look at that look look down below and you'll find me see you guys later see you guys around